Hello and welcome once again back to my 8-bit computer. Today we're going to talk about the program counter, which is this register over here. And the, the function of the program counter is to keep track of the byte inside the program that we're currently executing. Now I have a very simple program here. It's a, a variation on the program we had in the last episode. Um, in this episode, let, let's say we start at start here, uh, all we're going to do is we're going to use the stack pointer, which is this pointer over here, as our memory pointer. And we're going to use a new instruction, pop, and, and what pop does is it reads a value which is uh, currently pointed to by the stack pointer in memory, puts that value into the A register, and then increases the value of the stack pointer. So in fact, that's a, a load from the address pointed to by stack pointer followed by an immediate increase of the stack pointer. So it's those two operations just rolled into one instruction. So it's very similar to what we had in the last program. Um, and we're not actually going to store anything in RAM. So we're just going to check uh, this pop instruction will actually influence the flags. And we're going to check if we, if we have a, an overflow. So if we've reached the top of memory and if we have, then we're going to halt the program. And if we haven't, we're just going to start all over again. So this is basically half of the program we had in the last video, so we're just reading out random contents of memory. I've uh, only just turned this computer on and entered the contents, and so we should see uh, completely random bytes in memory. And we're going to use this program to have a look in a little bit more detail at the program counter. So uh, if I just let it run for a little while, then you'll see the stack pointer is increasing, going through every successive byte in memory, and we're just getting out whatever random contents happen to be in the memory at any time. So let me just uh, stop the clock quickly, and let me uh, reset it into a known state. So here we are at address 14, and this is address 14, 1110. So we should be exactly at the pop instruction. And so now we're going to have uh, we're going to pay close attention to this program counter. So at the moment its value is 14. And it's being instructed to output its contents onto the bus. So the program counter, just like any other register, has an enable signal. In this case it's the program counter enable signal. Uh, and the, the consequence of asserting that signal will be that the value of, what, of whatever happens to be in the register is output onto the bus here and so some other part of the computer can, can read in that value. And in this case, the memory address register, which is uh, over here, is going to read in that value. And the reason, of course, is it's going to have a look at address 14 in program memory at the instruction that's in there. And it's going to read in that instruction so that uh, it's, it's, it will know what to do. So that's the first thing. It's going to just output the contents of the program counter onto the bus and load them into some other register. So the program counter, just like any register, needs to be able to output its contents on the bus. And so on the next rising clock edge, that 14 is latched into the memory address register. Now, on this clock tick, what will happen is that instruction here, which is pop into register A, is going to get moved into the instruction register. But what also is going to happen is we have another signal here, which is the program counter count signal. And that signal is going to instruct the program counter to increase its value by 1. And the reason for that is that once we've read in this instruction, which we're going to do on this rising edge, we don't really need that address 14 anymore. We're going to have to get ready after all of this executes for the next instruction, which is at address 15. So unless we have some special situation, such as a jump in one of these instructions, the program counter should, under normal circumstances, simply increment itself by one all the time. So that's a function that we've built into this program counter. So it, it can always add one to its current value. And we can instruct the program counter to do that using this program counter count signal. And that's what's going to happen on the next clock edge. So this 14 will increment by one to become 15. And at the same time, these signals over here are going to organize this RAM contents to come into the instruction register. So, okay, let's have a look at that. And so, indeed, the program counter is now 15, and the instruction uh, is also now ready in RAM. 
And so now what's going to happen is the pop instruction. So that's a combination of, of ALU. We're going to use the ALU actually to calculate the new stack pointer address. And at the same time, the value of the stack pointer is going to get set into the memory address register and then it's going to read the contents into A. Now, we're not terribly interested in that for this episode, so we're just going to skip through that and see that was the value 246 that was in RAM. And so now we're ready to execute the next instruction, which is at address 15. And so at 15, we have this jump carry to the value halt. So once again, the program counter is being instructed to output its contents onto the bus. This time it's 15. And that 15 is going to get written into the memory address register. And that will happen. There it is. And so now the next instruction, which is the jump carry on the next uh, clock pulse, is going to get latched into the instruction register. And at the same time, the program counter will increase its value by 1, because it's going to uh, want to point at the next instruction. All right, so let's do that. And so here we have the jump carry, and the program counter is now at value 16. Very well. But this is a jump carry instruction. And the idea of the jump carry instruction is to have a look at the carry flag, which is a flag which is set by ALU operations. And if you look in the program, the previous instruction was a pop instruction, and the pop instruction does some arithmetic on the stack pointer, and so it might uh, influence the flags and so it might set the carry flag but of course it didn't because we're still in the middle of memory uh, we're, we're far from the end at this moment so the carry flag isn't set and that means this jump shouldn't occur but of course the program counter at this moment is set to 16 because that's the next byte behind this jump carry instruction which is at byte 15 but in this particular case byte 16 contains the address we would jump to if the carry was set. But of course we don't want to jump there. But we also don't want to execute this byte as an instruction because it's not an instruction, it's an address. The next instruction is actually at byte 17. So even though we're not jumping, this instruction isn't quite complete because the program counter is still pointing at the wrong address. It needs to point one address further. So for this instruction, for the jump carry instruction, in the case when the carry flag is not set, there is still one thing left to do, and that is to increase the program counter by one more. And so there is, once again, a control signal here telling the program counter to increase its value by one. And so that's all that will happen on the next clock pulse. There it is. And now the program counter is pointing at address 17, and address 17 is the next instruction, after having successfully ignored the two bytes of the jump carry instruction. All right, so now we're once again at the beginning of an instruction. So the program counter is being instructed to output its contents onto the bus. And this program counter is going to get set into the memory address register. So that happens. And now when we're in program memory and the next instruction, which is this jump instruction, will be read into the instruction register. At the same time, the program counter is being increased so that it points to the next instruction. There we are, and so now the program counter once again has increased by one. And here is our jump instruction. Now what is a jump? Well, in this case, we want to jump to the location loop in the program. And the location loop here is simply the instruction at address 14. So what we really want to do is, rather than the program counter, as it is right now, pointing at address 18, we would like it to point at address 14, which is the value of this constant loop. Loop being an address or a label is actually equal to the address of that instruction, which is 14. So somehow we need to get 14 into that program counter. And so in fact, this is very similar to a data instruction where we embed the value we want to write into a particular register inside the program. And so in this case, we've embedded the value 14. This is 14 in binary. See? It's the same value. Inside the program. And so what we want to do is we want to get this value out of program memory and write it into the program counter. Well, how do we get this out of program memory? Well, curiously enough, 
we have a look at the memory address in program memory where the program counter is pointing. So at the moment it's pointing at address 18 and address 18 contains the address that we really want to write into the program counter. So the first thing it's going to do is to take that 18, put it out onto the bus and, and uh, write it into the memory address register. All right, and so there's that 18. And so now we can have a look in program memory at address 18 and we'll find this value 14. And so that 14 is going out onto the bus. This is program memory outputting onto the bus. And this time that will be written into the program counter. And so this is the third operation which we can perform with the program counter. We've already seen numerous instances where the program counter outputs its contents onto the bus. We've also seen occasions where the program counter, independently of anything else happening in the computer, can increment its value by one. And this is the last function. We want it to be able to take a value on the bus and store that inside itself. And so that's what's going to happen on this next clock tick. And there it is, 14. And that's how we implement the jump instruction. So now we've in fact moved, or, or we've done a data instruction on the program counter, if you like, with the value 14. And now that's in the program counter. The next time we start an instruction, we're going to read the instruction at address 14, which is our pop instruction again. And so we're right back where we started. So that 14 is going into the memory address register. And now we're reading out the contents of that instruction, which is the pop instruction. And once again, we're going to increase the program counter by a value of 1. And there we are. So here is a closer look at the program counter. And as we just saw, we really need it to perform three functions. It needs to be able to output its contents onto the bus when it's instructed so by a PC program counter enable signal. We want it to write a value from the bus into itself when it gets a program counter write signal. And we want it to be able to increase its value by one when it gets a program account signal. Now this program counter um, is extremely similar to the program counter which Benita built in his episode. And uh, in the description of my video, you'll find a link to his videos which show how he built his program counter. The biggest difference is that we are dealing with 8 bits of address. And in Benita's computer, the program counter, since it's a memory address, is only 4 bits long. And if you have a good look at that video, you'll see that the, the principal component of his program counter is a chip called, in his case, the 74LS161. And since I'm using, excuse me, uh, I'm using HCT chips, uh, mine is a 74HCT161. Uh, and let's just have a look at the pinout on that chip and try and get it in the camera there. And so the way that chip works is it has four Q outputs. And so those uh, are uh, always output. Uh, so these, these signals are always active. Um, and in addition, it has two enable signals, which for whatever reason are called T enable and P enable. And these both need to be set, and if they are both high, then on the next rising clock pulse, these four bits will increment their binary value by one. So this one will always toggle, and this one will toggle if that one was a one, and this one will toggle if that one was a one, and this one will toggle if that one was a one. Uh, if you look at Benita's videos, you'll, you'll see that he goes into the details of how one of these counters work, and they're, they're based on uh, flip-flops, toggle latches, which uh, latch whenever the previous bit, uh, which toggle whenever the previous bit uh, is high. And that's how one of these counters work. Now, one of these chips provides me with four bits. And of course, that's not enough. We need to be able to count eight bits. And the good thing about this chip is it gives us a trick to do that. It has this signal here on pin 15. And this chip is smart enough to realize that since we have two input signals, 
One of these signals could be controlled by the control logic uh, and set to 1 or 0 depending on whether we want the, the counter to count on the next clock pulse. And the second signal could be controlled by another instance of a 74HCT161, which would tell it to only count on specific circumstances, in particular when this counter reaches 15. Because when this counter reaches 15 and it's instructed to increase by 1, well, it's going to fall back to 0 again. But of course, at that time, we would like the next counter to increase by 1. And so what we can do is we can cascade various of these counters together by taking this uh, output signal, which they call TC, and hooking it up to one of the two input signals on the next chip. And so if you have a look at this program counter, these are the two instances of the 74HCT161. And this chip is managing the lower four bits of the counter, and this chip is managing the higher four bits of the counter. And so if you look at this chip, one of its enable signals is permanently tied high, and its other enable signal is coming from the control logic on this yellow wire. And so this chip, whenever the control logic instructs it to do so, will count by one. It'll do so right now, for example. If, if we were to increase the counter now, that's what would happen. But then we have this output signal here. And we can feed that into that same count control signal on the second chip, uh, which is in fact pin number 10. This is pin number 10. And so we're feeding this chip's this chip's pin number 15 into pin number 10 of the second chip. And if all of these bits were to be 1, we can actually we can have a look at that signal. I can put an LED in here, like that, so you can see what it's doing. There we are. So at the moment, that signal isn't set. So even though we're going to count, and if I increase the counter, then this value will increase to 15. But because this signal isn't being set, even though that control signal is being wired through to this chip, it still won't count because its second control signal isn't set. This first chip isn't telling it to roll over. And so these top bits will stay zero, which is, of course, what we want, even though we aren't counting. So. There we count by one, okay, so the uh, bit too much LED activity here. Okay, so, but when this counter moved to 15, this chip now realizes that the next time it's going to be instructed to count, it will roll over to zero. And so it's asserting its pin number 15, it's T sig TC signal, which we've connected to the counter on the next chip. And so the next time that this chip will count, it's going to cascade its count into the, the, the chip representing the higher four bits. And so these four bits will become one. And that's exactly what happens. And that's how we move from address 15 to address 16. And, of course, the same will happen when we get to 4 here again, and then we'll move uh, on to address 32, and so on and so on. And so that's how we can use this same HCT161, which only has four inputs, and four outputs, excuse me, um, to count 8 bits nonetheless. Now, the rest of the chip works exactly the same way as in Benito's computer. The outputs on the four lower uh, bytes, on the four lower bits are here, and on the four higher bits are here. And they're all being redirected into this buffer chip. And this buffer chip, this is our infamous 
HCT245, which we've used in every single other register up until now. So it is able to move, connect the contents of B electrically to these A pins or not, depending on an output enable signal. And so that's what this chip is. And so it's being instructed to either send the data, which is now on these eight pins, four of them from that counter and four of them from this counter, back onto the bus or not. And finally, the HCT161 has another feature. It is able to either count if both of these signals are asserted, but it is also able to simply input a value from its P inputs whenever this signal is asserted. And so we're using that feature to be able to input a value from the bus. And these are all connected. These top uh, most significant four bits are connected to the inputs on that counter. And these bits are connected to the inputs on that counter. So that's how our program counter works. So for completeness sake, here is a look at a uh, diagram of the program counter. We have the eight bus lines here. So they connect, the, the lower four bits connect to the lower four counter, and the higher four bits of the bus connect to this higher counter. So they provide the input pins, which we would load into these counters whenever we are asserting this load signal on pin nine. And of course we would do that whenever the control logic is asserting a program counter write signal. On the other hand, the values of the program counter are always output onto these Q pins, so we can always read that value off of the LEDs, um, and they are sent through this buffer back onto the bus whenever its enable is asserted, and of course that happens when the program counter is being instructed to enable its contents onto the bus. And finally, we have a program counter count signal, and so that signal is connected to these ENP signals on both the chips, here and here. And the second enable signal on the lower chip is permanently on. And on the higher order chip, that signal is connected to this pin 15, this is what the documentation calls TC, this diagram calls it carry, from this counter into that one, and that will be asserted whenever these four pins are all one. Now, since we have a very little bit of time left, um, I want to talk a little bit about the instruction register, which is this register here. Now, uh, this register is extremely simple on my computer. In fact, it consists of a single chip, which is this HCT, 74HCT377. So it really is just a register chip. So we have the contents coming in from the bus into that register. But that register, so that these blue wires then continue further on to, to the address logic, which we had a look on in the last episode. But the only relevant inputs for the instruction register are these. And so we have output wires from there, which are these green wires, you can see some of them poking out here and the other four poking out there, and they go straight into the control logic. And we're using all eight bits of our instruction register to be uh, decoded by the control logic, so the instruction register never has to output back onto the bus. And that's why it doesn't need a buffer chip, because it, these, these signals never go onto the bus. It only ever inputs from the bus. And it does so when the control logic tells it to, using uh, its control signal, which is in fact here. It's uh, difficult to see with the shadow, but this yellow wire here is the input which it receives from the control logic. So on, in the beginning of every instruction, the control logic will tell the instruction register in, to input contents from the bus, which in fact come from program memory, and latch them inside itself. And for example, on this next clock tick, that just happened. And so here is the new instruction. Now, the reason why uh, our 
instruction register works differently than the instruction register on Benita's computer is that in the case of immediate operands, such as this jump instruction or this data instruction, the data, which is the operand, isn't part of the instruction. It's always in the next byte. So all of these bits, all eight of them, are all part of the instruction. And we never have to output any of them back on the bus. They go straight into the control logic, which then decides what to do based on these opcodes. Now, speaking of opcodes, let's have a little look at how we want to actually encode our different assembly instructions into opcodes. Uh, because after all, the, our computer is, is supposed to execute instructions, which, which we've been writing down in assembly now. And I've uh, always been showing you opcodes, but it, we might want to have a little think about how to build up such an instruction set and how to encode it uh, into machine, machine language uh, bytes. So we're talking about instructions like this one, like move uh, from the C register into the A register, or loading RAM contents pointed to by the D register into the B register, or storing a value uh, into RAM at the address pointed to by the A register, which is actually the contents of the A register, or moving a value which we've embedded inside the program, in this case into the SAC pointer or jumping, moving around in the program to a specific address. And so we want to encode all of these kinds of instructions uh, into an instruction byte. Uh, and ideally, we'd like that instruction byte to be eight bits long. And so, uh, as you can see, all of these instructions uh, contain an actual mnemonic, uh, uh, what we want to happen, and a series of operands. Uh, usually one or two operands. And so they, we can usually divide those into a destination and a source operand. And uh, we probably need to encode the source and the destination as part of those eight bits. And then whatever is left will be used to encode what we actually want to do with those operands. Well, all right. So uh, if we want to encode our operands, those are basically registers, we, we can start assigning to the register A, for example, a value of 0. We can say the B register is value 1, the C register is 2, and the D register is 3. So, so far we've been taking up 2 bits to encode a register. But then what about a register such as the stack pointer? we are run out of bits, basically. And so, okay, perhaps 2 bits isn't enough. We probably need 3 bits to encode of all, all of our registers. So, all right. We'll uh, use three bits for each register. And so now we can encode the stack pointer as register number four. And then we have the program counter, which we can encode as register number five. So uh, if we do that, then we see that each of the source and the destination parts of our instruction is going to be three bits long. So that's six bits in total. And that really only leaves us two bits to encode the instruction. Now. Two bits doesn't seem very much uh, to encode all of the instructions that we're planning for our CPU, but let's just naively start and, and, and see where we end up. So, for example, the move instruction seems to be one of the simplest. Let's just give that an instruction value of 0, 0, and then we'll encode the operands, which in this case are the B register and the destination and the D register as the source. We'll encode those with the, the values we decided, so the B register will be 001, which is register number one, and the D register will be 011, which is register number three. So let's just say that that's the opcode for this move from D into B. All right, so then move from the stack pointer into the C register would be the same 00, zero again. Then the destination operand in this case is the second register, 010, and then the stack pointer is the fourth register, 100. Zero. Uh, here is a load instruction. So a load is obviously not a move. So, okay, we'll, we'll use the next available instruction value, which would be 0, 01. And then we're loading into the B register, which we said was register number one. And we're loading from the address, which is located in the D register. And so we said that that was register number three, 0, 01. One. And then we could have a store instruction. And a store is not a move and it's not a load. So, okay, we're going to have to use another instruction uh, for that. We'd say that's one zero. And then the, the operands in this case were storing into the address pointed to by the A register, which we said was register zero. 
from uh, the program counter in this example, which we said was register number five. And so that would be the opcode for that store instruction. Then we could have a, an add instruction, for example. Um, and so we really, we only have one opcode left, which is one one. And so the add instruction is going to use the ALU. And for the moment, I'm not gonna talk too much about the ALU. So let's just suppose that using some sort of magic, we can encode all of our ALU instructions somewhere uh, in that space, which is using one one as the most significant bits of our opcode. And so that also includes, for example, not on the register or things like increase and decrease. Let's just stick all of those somewhere in, in, in the one one space of our instruction set. Now we're still left with some instructions which we haven't been able to encode in, in these four bits. We have, for example, the data instruction, which needs to load the value embedded in the program code into the C register. Uh, how would we encode that? Or the pop instruction, we, we said in the very beginning that we'd like to use a stack properly and we want to provide the programmer with easy push and pop operations uh, onto and from the stack. So, okay, how, how would we encode that? Well, we've, we have these six values from zero to five, which we've assigned to the six program addressable registers. But that still leaves two possible combinations of three bits, which we're not using at all. And so, for example, for the push and pop instructions, we could say if we want to access or use the stack pointer as a pointer into memory and at the same time automatically increment or decrement it, well, we could do that by addressing the stack pointer with a slightly different value. So instead of saying register number four, if in our instruction we say register number six, we could sort of signal that, okay, we want you to use the stack pointer, but we also want you to auto increment or decrement it. And, and that way we could signify uh, in, in our opcode that we want to do a push or a pop. Similarly, we could say, okay, we want you to use the program counter uh, as a counter, uh, as, a, as a pointer into memory, for example, because we want you to get a value which is stuck somewhere in the middle of the program. Uh, but we don't really want you to treat it as you usually would the program counter because as we've seen in, in the previous few video, videos uh, when we're reading a value from which is embedded in the program we, we need to do some special things with the program counter we, we in fact we need to auto increment it as well so let's indicate that with another special value instead of saying value 5 we'll, address, we'll, we'll use a value of 7 in the register position to indicate that we're basically have an immediate operand which is embedded inside the program. So okay, if we do that, then we can say that this pop instruction from the stack into the B register is in fact a load instruction into the B register from the stack using that special value of six instead of four to say that we also want you to automatically increase the stack pointer once you've finished reading. And similarly for push, we can say that the push instruction is actually a store instruction using the stack pointer, but use the stack pointer and then automatically decrement it when you finished storing. So we're using this value of, of four, of, of six instead of four for the stack pointer. And we're pushing the value which is in the D register and that's just simply the value three, which we've already decided. Similarly, for the data instruction, so a data instruction into RB of an immediate value is, is in fact is, is a sort of a load or, or a sort of a move whereby the, the source operand is an immediate value which we need to go and fetch by looking in program memory pointed to by the program counter. And so we use the special value of 7 as the source operand. And then in the next byte, we're going to write the actual value and, and that's going to appear somewhere in our program code. We can use immediate operands for memory operations as well. So this instruction, we'd like to hard code address 255 in data memory, and we'd like to write the value of the program counter into that memory location. And so that value of 255 is also an immediate operand embedded in the program. And so we could consider that to be a store instruction 
where the destination address isn't a register but but is in fact an immediate piece of data which we need to access by manipulating the program counter so we use value 7 as the destination register and the source register in this case is simply the program counter and, and its register value was 5 and then in the next byte we're gonna write the 255 which in binary is all ones uh, into our program code and so uh, using these extra let's say pseudo register values uh, we've been able to add a few extra instructions into the the move load and store space now what about jump instructions well as we saw in the beginning of the video a, a jump instruction really is is just a, a data instruction of an immediate value into the program counter so since we already have a way of encoding a data instruction of loading an immediate value into a register well we just need to do that for the program counter so if we move if we use zero zero to indicate a move from an immediate operand one 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 into the program counter one zero one and then in the next byte we write the value we actually want to write into the program counter well that will represent a jump so we can encode our jump instruction as well what about call Remember that the call instruction is, is going to jump into a different part of the code, but before it does so, it's going to write its return address, i.e. the contents of the program counter, onto the stack. So what that is really is a push of the contents of the program counter onto the stack. Well, we already decided how we were going to handle push instructions. They're, they're actually store instructions using the stack pointer as the memory reference, but instead of using the, the value of 4 which we assign to the stack pointer we're using this pseudo value of 6 to indicate that we also want the stack pointer subsequently decreased to indicate that, that we're using an actual push stack operation and the value that we want to write onto the stack is simply the contents of the program counter and we've assigned that register value number 5 so that would be a call instruction a return instruction is the exact opposite so for a return instruction what we need to do is we need to jump to an address in, in program memory and we've written that address onto the stack. So we need to pop the contents of the stack into the program counter. But we've already decided how to encode pop instructions. Pop instructions are in fact load instructions. And so we're loading into the program counter, which is 101, and we're uh, using the address which is located in the stack pointer. But we're not using the usual value of 4 for the stack pointer. We're using 6 instead to indicate that we subsequently want the stack pointer to be increased again. So, so we want to emulate a real stack operation. No operation. What, what is a no operation? It means do absolutely nothing. Well, we could argue that if you move the contents of any register into itself, you actually haven't done anything at all. So we could encode... The no, the no operation instruction as a move from the A register, which is register 0, into the A register, which is register 0. So uh, by a nice coincidence, that actually gives us uh, the opcode of all zeros, which would indicate the no operation. Now using this formalism, we've actually defined a certain number of instructions which don't make any sense. For example, moving a value into the stack pointer and then increasing or decreasing the stack pointer doesn't make any sense at all. That really only makes sense when we're using the stack pointer to point somewhere in memory. But if we're just moving an actual value into the stack pointer, using a 6 in that location rather than a 4 makes no sense at all. So these opcodes, anything beginning with 00110 and then three arbitrary bits really don't make any sense at all. So we could hijack them and use them for some other instruction. So we could consider that those eight instructions in this case are still free. We can still assign them to something else. Similarly, moving into an immediate operand makes no sense at all because an immediate operand is, is a fixed value. You, you can't move anything in there. Um, and so that instruction, which, which theoretically would be a 0, 0 for move and then 1, 1, 1 for a destination of an immediate operand, well, that makes no sense at all. So once again, we have eight 
possible bytes here which we could assign to some totally different instruction because we're never going to write an, a move into an immediate anywhere in our code. And similarly for load, so there's no point in loading from memory anything into an immediate operand. That makes no sense at all because uh, an immediate value, you, you can't possibly change it. So here again, we have another eight bytes of in, in, inside our instruction space, which at the moment we're not using because we don't wish to support such instructions. They, they don't make any sense. Also store. Uh, once again, there's the stack pointer. Uh, using it in an automatic uh, increment or decrement mode really only makes sense when you're using it as a, as a pointer into memory. So for a store instruction, that makes perfect sense when it's the destination operand, but it makes no sense at all if it's the source operand. And so here, again, we have uh, eight instructions uh, which, which don't make any sense, uh, which, which we're not using for any sane instruction at this moment, and so we could reassign them later on. And uh, there are many more combinations, and, and in fact, using the, the opcodes definition, let's say, that we've, that we've come up with so far, we'll find that there are actually a, a, a whole set of holes, let's say, of instructions which we haven't assigned. And so we can use those to assign any instructions that we haven't been using yet. Instructions like, like the conditional jump, so we, 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 have, we support four different ALU flags and we have corresponding jump instructions for every one of them. So we have a jump on carry, a jump on zero, a jump on negative, etc, etc. So we could assign those to some of the instructions that uh, that were left over with some of the holes in, in our current instruction space. Same with the halt instruction and it hasn't, we could assign that to, to one of the unused instructions and there might be several others. So hopefully you can see that Using our naive approach, but being a little bit smart or interpreting move and load and store instructions in a particular way, we are actually able to encode most of what we want to support in our assembly programs using that kind of formalism. And so the only thing we've left open for the moment are the ALU instructions, any instruction beginning with the bits 1, 1. And uh, we'll just have a look at those in, in, in come up with a way to encode those when we look at the ALU in the next videos. So that concludes today's episode where we had a look at the program counter which is, a, which is able to uh, read from the bus and write into itself or to write out its contents onto the bus and is able to simply count whenever it's instructed to do so by the control logic. And we also had a quick look at the instruction register which really is, is only ever inputs an instruction from the bus, which will usually come from memory, and then outputs that straight to the control logic. Now in the next episode, we're going to start having a look at our ALU, or arithmetic and logical unit. Uh, and this is quite a complex unit uh, and is uh, quite different from what uh, Ben Eater built in his computer. So uh, we'll probably be spending two or three episodes to fully understand the arithmetic and logic unit, which is able to calculate, it can add, subtract, it can perform logical operations, and or not. And while calculating, it will also set a number of flags, which the control logic can use to make decisions. So we'll see, we'll start looking at all that in the next episode. See you then.